So, uh, it's an awesome few, introduction. Yeah, man. A few years ago, we, um, uh, I was in the uh, backstage area of a, at a men's event, and the great Tony Dungy was uh, kind of huddled up with about three of us just talking about the work of God right. in your life. And I knew at that moment I wanted people to hear what all God had been recently doing in your life, just the resurgence and the revival in your heart. Right. And uh, we, we've been trying to get you and trying to get you. And then, honestly, uh, as hard as it was to try to get a hold of, of you and your busy schedule, we had some of our team, Stephen uh, Thomas and a couple of folks that found out you were at the mall last yeah, year. Track me down. Yeah, signing stuff, you know, yeah. and, and they, they, they literally took like jerseys that had Vic off of their wall. They're big fans and they were headed that way. Yeah. And they got your attention and said, we'd love for you to come to Liberty. And you graciously, uh, you know, said yes. And so welcome to the house. We know your story. We know yeah. about Virginia Tech, all the attention you got. We know, obviously, a um, $130 million contract when you were a 22-year-old kid, a football legend in the NFL, and then yeah. just the, the massive, massive failure uh, of you going to prison because of the horrific, you know, actions, and then really seeing the redemption of your story. And right. so take us through that in your own words. I'd love for you to um, tell your story in your own words. Well, it's a very interesting story. I, I started out as uh, a young kid, six years old, watching the National Football League, watching the NFL, watching games with my grandmother, uh, and looked at her and told her, Grandma, I want to play in the National Football League one day. And I don't know if she took me serious, but what I seen on TV, I felt at a young age that I was put on earth to, to do it. And I would go in the, in the backyard and play with my friends and uh, was probably the best athlete you know, at the age of seven or eight. And it was evident to me. Uh, I wanted to follow those dreams. I knew it was gonna be a, gonna be a tough road because I, as I grew older, I started to understand that, listen, life is not about just playing football. Uh, I have to be the best student that I could be. Uh, alongside being a good football player, I have to be the best uh, citizen in my neighborhood. I have to be the best son to my mom. I have to be the best brother to my brothers and sisters. And uh, walk a different walk. And I knew at the time that things had to be different. So I told myself, what can I do to be different? Mm. And when I turned 12 years old, because I wanted to play in the National Football League, because I had big dreams because I set goals when I was very young. And I don't know if my friends around me was doing the same things that I did, but I wanted an edge. I took a Bible and I put the Bible under my pillow. It's at the age of 12. And I said, if I'm gonna start somewhere, I'm gonna start with God. And my family wasn't really into church. Um, we didn't go every weekend because of transportation and, and, and for various reasons. But I said to myself, it's not about being in church. I can bring church to me. Mm. And uh, at the age of 12, I started to open the Bible and read it the best that I could without really interpreting what was being, what I was reading. Because, you know, it was, uh, I, wasn't say, I wouldn't say it was not understandable for me because I did do well in school, so I understood, uh, you know, how to read. But it was different, you know, it was different. Uh, so I said, this is a start. Start right here, and we'll see where God takes me. And uh, I think over the next four or five years, I fared very well in terms of uh, growing up to be the kid that I wanted to become, the, the man that I wanted to become. And, uh, you know, really putting a lot of emphasis on God and my faith. So you grow up in a in a in an environment where, uh, and we'll get into that in a minute, in Newport Beach, where things were just definitely going up against you, and things were tough. Not in your in your immediate family, uh, where things always about the things of God, but you, but you had a legacy of faith, yeah. and someone who was always reading and reciting Psalm 23 over your life, and uh, you talk about that. You talk about yeah. how when you. We're back down in the valley after you'd made such horrific mistakes and you were in prison at Leavenworth that uh, the Psalms really meant more to you yeah. and that kind of rekindled. Yeah, well, God was really good to me. Uh, I had a great career in high school. Uh, 
wanted to play football and, and be good enough uh, to receive a scholarship. Uh, I found out the hard way uh, because I had to quit basketball my junior year that you can't go to college if you don't have the, the right grades, uh, if you don't excel in the classroom. My mom made me quit. Uh, that's another story within itself uh, because I fought so many battles with her because I, I got accustomed to being the guy in school and, and getting all the recognition, even in, the, in, in high school. Uh, so I felt that, you know, grades was very important, school was important. Uh, I got the scholarship, uh, went to Virginia Tech, had an illustrious career, and we can talk about that, um, and then got drafted into the NFL. And I felt it was all because of this. And at one point in my life, I forgot about this. And when I forgot about that, I found myself in a very detrimental situation, uh, in part because of the environment that I grew up in, no excuses, uh, but you know the things that I seen and the things that I thought I was understanding was not reality. And uh, I found myself in a very dark place. I found myself in prison, uh, 23 months as you seen on the screen. And uh, it was a deep, reevaluation process of my life and, and my perseverance moving forward. So Mike, you start out, you know, just really living for the Lord, the, the, the Word of God as your foundation. This was most important to me. Yeah, and then it gets away from you. Yeah. Talk to us about uh, how it got away from you. Obviously, 22 years old, yeah. multi, multi-million dollar right. shoe deal yeah. on TV all the time. How does all that make you not just become a bigger giver, not make you yeah. even more humble? How does that not make you a bigger arrow towards God and all of a sudden get to the point where not only are you a celebrity, but you're um, involved in like dog fighting and involved yeah. in all the things that eventually got revealed? I'll try to summarize this so everybody in this crowd can understand it. When I was 12 years old and I was reading this Bible, I had dreams and, and aspirations of becoming a, a, a football player in the National Football League and I felt like this was the gateway to get there. Uh, even though I didn't understand it, uh, and throughout my high school career and throughout my college career, I put a lot of emphasis into trying to understand the Bible as much as I could and, and, and being a deep faith-based guy uh, to the, the capacity that I knew I could, the time that I had. Uh, when I got drafted and I got the $100 million contract, and when I went to Atlanta, this didn't come with me. I must have left it under the pillow in the neighborhood that I grew up in, and I really felt like I did it on my own. Yeah. You know, I totally forgot about um, the prayers that I had at night, numerous prayers, numerous nights, where I asked God to forgive me for all my sins. You know, I know I run around this neighborhood and I do a bunch of crazy things. And I may be looking up to the wrong people who do a bunch of crazy things. But in spite of that, I'm going to be a guy who's going to try to do the right thing when my mom's not watching, when my high school coach is not watching, you know, when my dad is not watching. Because I understand that you know, your character is based on what you do when people are not watching. I learned that the hard way. And when I left that Bible behind, and I got drafted, and from that day forward, maybe into the time I got incarcerated, I never picked up the Bible and read it again. May have said, uh, just a guesstimation, 10 prayers from 2001 to 2007. Now, I think the correlation is that I lost sight of everything that, you know, I felt you know, I needed in order to become the man that I wanted to become. For all of, from all the role models that I had, from my high school coach to my uncles uh, to Frank Beamer, I just left everybody behind, and it was difficult. So, Michael, all that just eventually bubbles over, yeah. and you're exposed for dogfighting, but there's so much more broken yeah. inside of who you were and you're embarrassed, there's yeah. all this shame. You, know, you see the, the trail of just hurt that you'd caused. Now you are in prison, and, um, and God just begins to 
rekindle himself to you. And in the, you, you talk about how the Psalms really meant a lot to you in your book. Yeah. Uh, talk about that for just a second. Well, when I got to prison, then I, I found this again. And then I started to open it up again. And, you know, just very surreal moments uh, from the first time they closed the prison door. You know, I just kind of stared at the door for about 30 seconds and then, you know, I wasn't comprehending what was happening in my life, so I jumped in the bed. It's not a bed, it's a crate, it looks like a crate. I jumped in the crate or the bunk or whatever you want to call it and I just put the covers over my head and covered my head up for about, you know, 30 minutes. And uh, right then and there, I just, you know, summarized my life up until that point. And I said, what's missing? It's a lot that's missing. I feel like I shouldn't be here, but, you know, one side of my heart is telling me, you know, you, you shouldn't be in this position, but the other side is saying, well, you knew what you was getting into, and you knew when you was dog fighting, when you was doing the things that you was doing that, you know, it was a pointless activity, but you wasn't strong enough to say no and get away from the people, and you are held accountable and responsible, so you have to deal with it. So I opened the Bible back up, and my mom told me before I went in, you know, Psalms 23 will get you through. And all those years I was going through the Bible and trying to interpret what was being said and, and trying to understand it. When I went to 23, it gave me strength. Yeah. You know, it gave me a, a reason to believe. It, it, it empowered me in such a way where, you know, uh, empathy and sympathy became important. And, uh, perseverance became important and being a role model became important. All these things that I forgot about, all these things that was unimportant to me, all of a sudden became important again. But the only thing was I had four, 565 days to, until I can go out and put that all to work again. And so all of a sudden that actually becomes a blessing, the sideline. Yeah. Yeah. The moment in prison becomes a, a moment that begins to actually set you free again a little bit. And yeah. we're not talking about worshiping the Bible, but the God of the Bible who yes. speaks through it. Can you, uh, uh, we, we were talking this morning about just you reading that very psalm, because I think some people today need to hear the very encouraging truth of it. Yeah, we'll read um, it in a second. Yeah. We'll I, read it together. I want you to read that over our students as, right. a, and as a prayer over yeah. them. But talk to me about in the middle of all that, not just the Word of God coming back into your life, but mentors coming into yeah. your life. Tony Dungy came to visit you, yeah. uh, just a, a passionate, passionate pastor, yeah. uh, you know, to a lot of players. I think you all had the pleasure of uh, hearing Tony Dungy speak. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the pleasure of getting to know him in early 2009. He came to visit me in Leavenworth, and it was a visit that I never thought I would get. And I was, laying in, I was laying in the bed one day uh, at Leavenworth, and uh, they called my name on the loudspeaker, report to the main office, go to the main office, and it's Tony Dungy standing right there. Now, when I see him, I think I'm about to go home. I'm like, he's here to help me get released, to free me. You know, this is a blessing. Thank you, God, all the prayers of now uh, coming to fruition. And he just said, no, I want to talk to you for a couple hours. And this is not about you getting released. Uh, it's about you b getting released from the things that you had covered all of, your, all of your life and the things that you've been hiding all your life. It's time to release that, not to be released from prison. You're not ready yet. Stayed there about four months to go. And we sat in the visitation room, and he wanted to know that I was remorseful. He wanted to know that I was willing and accepting uh, the fact that I did wrong, but I was going to accept the fact that it was going to be different people in my life, different mentors, uh, you know, different role models that I would have to uh, embrace at the age of 27, you know, after going five or six years of thinking I knew everything and I had all the answers, uh, and I didn't. And uh, the conversation was very surreal. Um, you know, it was like he was talking and I was like, digesting every word that came out of his mouth because, you know, Tony, he's real, uh, you know, he, he has this subtle type of personality, uh, but everything he says means a lot. 
and I just wanted to soak everything in and get away from him as fast as I could and get back into my unit and just digest every word that he had said. I think it was pretty interesting that he was coming in and you didn't talk a lot of football for three hours. We talked no football. Yeah, you talked a lot about the Lord and he wanted to know about remorse. He wanted to know about repentance because it's one thing when you're in trouble just for you to throw God on it. Right. It's another thing when you're in trouble for you to come to the end of yourself. And the Bible's so clear, you know, um, you must deny yourself, pick up the cross, then follow him. Yes. You know, we must come to the end of ourselves so many times and people without remorse and repentance go, well, God's just going to forgive me, which means then God is condoning instead of comforting and then bringing you out. Right. Talk to me about the importance of um, owning your mistake, not blaming anybody else, but owning what you did wrong. Yeah. Well, like I said earlier, I just grew up in, I grew up in a neighborhood where it was violence everywhere and Newport Beach. In Newport News, Virginia. And I just felt. No, no, cool. Nice. Nice. (laughs) All right. (laughs) There's usually a couple people from the 757 somewhere out there in this world. (laughs) But I told myself uh, at the age of 10, you know, I didn't want to be a product of my environment. I wanted my environment to become a product of me. And I fell into the trap. You know, I seen so many things happening where it was fast money, you know, it was, you know, people deceiving one another, so many ways to get over. I can hide a lot from my mom. Uh, she, she's not, you know, over here and when, I'm, when I'm there. And, you know, I just really didn't embrace the fact that, you know, keeping God first was, was most important. You know, after all those years of, you know, reading the Bible and, and, and trying to interpret it, you know, it became d- very difficult for me, and I, I, I used my surroundings as an excuse. And what I learned was that it was no excuse. You know, we all are responsible for the things that happen in our lives that we're allowed to happen or that we see happening, and we don't try to change or we don't uh, try to correct. Uh, and if it wasn't for me wanting to become this larger-than-life football player at the age of, you know, eight years old, then I may not be sitting here, you know, talking to you guys as of right now. And I think in that sense, God saved me. I think I was one of the ones that he had a hand on because my heart and my intentions was in the right place. And I always felt that. But it's so much influence, you know, whether it's in, in elementary school, whether it's in middle school, high school, college, it's influenced every day. And you have to be strong enough to, uh, you know, see the difference in, in, in what's right and wrong and, and, and be able to weigh out pros and cons uh, on a 24-hour basis. Michael, your, your, um, your mistakes can literally become ministry. Tragedy can become testimony. And today... Yes. Not only have you testified before Congress, uh, you know, uh, on behalf of um, against animal abuse for animal welfare, but you've uh, you've become quite the spokesperson for that. I want us to uh, to watch this little video that they made, the Humane Society made, and then I want to ask you uh, about dog fighting and just the violence, and then your role as a believer for it. Let's let's watch this together. I was school today. It's the past. That's why uh, I opened up about it. Uh, Pretty much everybody around the world know about it or heard about it. And the kids coming up, they probably will hear about it at some point. To face all your demons, put them in the past, put them behind you, and and be forthright about it is the best thing to do. Don't forget about me. Don't forget about me. I wanted to be a voice uh, in the fight against animal cruelty because I don't want uh, kids to go down the wrong path and I don't want more animals to be hurt. So I vow to help more animals than I hurt. I, I feel like I owe that, uh, you know, to a lot of animals. Whether you're gonna have an animal or not, it's up to you. But if you do, you make sure you take care of them. So I want y'all to understand that pets have you know, feelings, they have emotions, and we gotta give them the same type of lifestyle that we would wanna have. 
What I would say to anybody who's out there who's currently fighting dogs, it's not the right thing to do. Just read between the lines and understand that if you're going to have a pet, if you're going to have an animal, you need to treat it with the utmost respect. You know, do something more productive with your life instead of taking animals and conducting them in pointless activity. And pass that on to all your friends because it's important for all y'all to know that. All right? Make sure y'all do it together. All right, let's get a little break. Together on three. What I've learned from the kids that I've had an opportunity One, two, three, to visit together. with is that they listen. They listen with an open mind. They ask questions. You know, I, like I tell them all, you can be a leader and everybody can be a voice and everybody can, can be an instrument of change. I think my partnership with the HSUS uh, has been great. You know, just an uh, outstanding opportunity for me to, to give back and uh, do the things that I, I set out to do amongst leaving prison and, uh, and we'll continue to move forward and try to be difference makers. Yeah. That's uh, well put together. That's a really big thing for us here at Liberty yeah. University. We, uh, we do about a half a million hours worth of volunteer work That's awesome. in the life of people, but also Great. the Humane Society here in the city has, uh, has had a lot of our students. I uh, asked for the numbers just for this conversation. Yeah. Uh, over 1,800 hours of volunteer work. Wow, uh, that's uh, impressive. You know, and, I'm sorry, over 1,800 students have volunteered with over 43,000 hours of volunteer work alone uh, this weekend. Uh, we gave $5,000 to that cause as well. President Falwell and his family are big advocates of the Humane yes. Society here. And so you're joining people who understand that God's called us to love people, right. to serve people, but that that's shown in the way that we treat all of God's creation. Absolutely. Um, talk to us about um, animal welfare. Talk to us about what you've learned since then and how you've become a voice. An unlikely voice yes. into that? Animal welfare is extremely important. And even when I was young, I felt that it was always the right thing to do. But I seen so many things growing up that it conflicted my mind mm. in terms of beliefs. And I had teachers who was, uh, you know, animal rights advocates and, and talked to us all the time about advocacy and, you know, uh, the relationships between, you know, animals and humans. and. Uh, so I understood it. I got it. And, you know, I would come home and see people in the neighborhood fighting dogs. And, you know, they'd be betting money, and I'm saying to myself, well, you know, this is, this is not what uh, Miss Ivory told me earlier. You know, I, I think it's wrong. Should I go over there and say something? But, you know, I'm nine years old. They're not going to listen to me. You know, these guys are 16, 17. And then I see a, a reoccurrence of it all the time. And then I see people in the neighborhood not really paying attention to it. So my perception of it was different uh, because of what I seen and not because of what I heard. And Miss Abby told me the right thing. And, you know, I'll go in detail about this. I got older. I started hanging with people who was into fighting dogs. Uh, it became more so about uh, competition and, and not about, you know, what was doing, doing the right things. And I fell into a trap of fighting dogs and thinking it was cool. And the ironic part about it is that the entire time I was doing it, I knew it was consequences behind it, so I would think, well, and this is at the age of 21, 22. I never seen a guy in my neighborhood get arrested for it. So it must not be the right, it must not be as bad. Um, you hear people talking about it and you hear about uh, dog rings in relations to a drug bust, but you know, guys get probation and they get, uh, you know, misdemeanor charges. So it may not be as bad, it must not be as bad. But that's irrational thinking. I know that now. I wish I would have knew it then. Uh, but, you know, so I was very conflicted, you know, mentally in terms of, uh, you know, ways to treat animals and how to, you know, uh, care for an animal. But the irony behind it, and for some reason I try to explain it, but I, people don't understand it, is that I'm an animal lover. My entire life I took care of stray dogs. 
Uh, my, my mom would tell you, I brung dogs in off the street to live in the house, and she would kick my butt because I'm hiding a dog in my room, and she don't know, and she's afraid of dogs. And, you know, so my heart and my passion was there for the animal world. I had birds growing up. I had uh, hamsters growing up. Always was a good caretaker, you know, the, the lifespan of they lived out their lifespan, so the responsibility part was there. And, uh, you know, I get to a certain point in my life where, uh, you know, pointless activity became important in the things that I was doing, uh, you know, being a role model and, and even playing the game of football. Uh, I spent more time involved in that uh, than I did studying, you know, film. You know, studying film because, you know, I was arrogant in a sense, and I thought I was untouchable. So all that stuff's connected, right? You 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 um, grew up hearing gunshots all the time. You saw just violence all around you. You go into a sport that just celebrates just violence, yeah. and then there's no accountability. Right. And little by little, those things take a guy who actually loves animals growing up yeah. and makes you an abuser. Yeah. Um, and so then now the Lord has really brought this back into your heart. And why make your, do you feel like, um, not just an unlikely candidate, but do you feel like God's forgiven you, but people are always making fun of you for that or coming in? And, yeah. and are you, and also, I'm curious, are, are you a pet owner now and as a yeah, father? I'm a, how does that play out? And, yeah, well, the responsibility uh, of being a pet owner uh, and working with the Humane Society, working with the President Wayne Pacelli, uh, I was able to kind of start all over. Mm. And, and my beliefs and, and, and what I wanted. And it, it, it took a while for me to get a, a, a pet. Um, and the pressure was on because my daughters, you know, from the time they turned two years old, they wanted a dog so bad. And I had to explain to them, <laughs> we can't have a dog because of what daddy, you know, did you know, a couple years ago, well, so, you know, well, daddy, what did you do? Now the conversation gets deeper, and, and, and now you have to tell the truth, and, and now just the relationship between myself and my kids will get strengthened, be, strengthened because, you know, I felt like being honest was important, and I told them, and they was very disappointed because they had to suffer because of my wrongdoings. I felt disappointed because they had to suffer because of my wrongdoings. And it was five years before we could before we can get a dog. We have one now. It's a Rottweiler. Her name is Lola. She's beautiful. She's very obedient. She's love. She's a part of our family. And now I understand the importance of the human and animal relationship because I had a chance to do it all over again. Thank God. Thank God because I thought it would never happen, and it was a reboot for me. And it was in part because of the Humane Society. Uh, you know, giving me that energy, giving me that strength, giving me that new belief uh, that, listen, you know, God condemns you, and, and things happen for a reason. And I felt that, you know, in those moments, you know, it was time for change. And, and I, I thank God that I was able to, you know, work with the Humane Society, work with, you know, a group of kids who was willing to listen because it was therapeutic for me to let a lot of things go. Now I want us to just uh, just stop right now and just think about ministry to our students and the people that are watching yeah. on Facebook Live. And um, um, I know that the difference between you and a lot of other people is that uh, when you made a mistake, it was just seen by the world. It became yeah. front page news, uh, you know. But a lot of our students, they they are in a in a season maybe of abuse or maybe in a season of of just putting God on the side, right. forgetting God under the pillow, the very blessings of God have become a curse yeah. now in their life. Yeah. I'd love for you to just um, read Psalm 23 over them and just let the Word of God that's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and cuts through bone and marrow do okay. what God's, did, God's cool. Word did in your life in that cool. prison cell. Yeah. And so can I ask you just to be approachable to this? How many of you know Psalm 23 already? Um, if, if you know it already, let it rekindle your heart for the Lord and His Spirit, if you've never really stopped to listen to it, listen to it from somebody who really had it 
reinvigorated in his life in a prison cell. And, and uh, let's, let's, let's just read that over. Let's do it. And I, I will say this. Uh, every night that I went to sleep in prison for 544 days, and I read different scriptures, um, but this one, when I had the down days, when I was, you know, I filed bankruptcy while I was in prison, um, you know, lost a ton of money, uh, and just really felt as if um, I needed the Lord again. I needed him, and I needed him right then and there, and I wanted it right then and there. But what I realized is God works on his own timing. Um, you know, I wanted to read this prayer, you know, and wake up the next morning and be released, but it wasn't the time. And in reading this prayer every day, it just made me a stronger person. It made me more of a believer, uh, and, and it, it really helped me to become a, a, a true man of God, you know, and strengthen my faith. So this is the prayer that I read every night for 544 nights um, in Leavenworth, uh, and every time I read it, it took on a different meaning, regardless of what I was going through in my life, good days and bad days. Psalms 23. And you can feel free to read it if you know it. Uh, you might help me read it a little better. It's been 15 years since I left college, so uh, still trying to make it work. The Lord is my shepherd. I like nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will feel no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And every time I read it, I believed it. And even when I just read it, it sent the same chills through my body that I had every night for those 544 nights because I believe this, and I think everyone in this crowd should believe in it too. And I think everyone should sleep with a Bible up under their pillow or mattress, just so, you know, in good faith, you know, you are doing, trying to do the right things in the eyes of God. Amen, Michael. Praise the Lord, man. Um, the question we always ask uh, so many of our guests is at uh, the very moment, end of the conversation is, um, and how can we specifically be praying for you? I know you're a Fox analyst. I know that you, uh, uh, you know, by the way, can you just 30 seconds before we pray for you, analyze the Super Bowl. I know you, you used to be an eagle. <laughs> but what's, what's your prediction on the score? Well, well let's, and, uh, let's keep these two guys stand up. Away from this guy. Stand up. Let's make, let's make sure we keep Eagles, these two. Patriot. Let's make sure we keep those guys away from one another. Um, a, 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 quick, a quick analysis on, on the game. Yeah. Um, Philadelphia, Nick Foles is an amazing story. By the way. Liberty University online student, Nick Foles, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Liberty University online student, Nick Foles. And, 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 and by the way, Nick Foles is a true man of God. Come on. Nick Foles, he, you know, he, he attends every Bible study that we had in Philadelphia. I missed a couple. He made every single one of them. So he, he's, a, he's a, a, a deep man of faith. Um, and the Philadelphia Eagles has a great defense. We all know that. They has a quarterback who believes and is a man of God true advantage, um, and they have the right, they have the right infrastructure now to win a Super Bowl. <laughs> Tom Brady, that's all I need to say. He's already got five rings. Yeah. About to need to use his second hand to go. Yeah, yeah, man. If we put a ring on this, on another finger, then, I mean, he's, Truly the GOAT. So, so who's going to win, man? You're the, you're the Fox analyst. The, the Philadelphia Eagles will win the Super Bowl. What's your score? What's your score prediction? 
What's your score prediction? Uh, 20 to 17 comes down to a field goal. It, it'll be a, it'll be a uh, dramatic Super Bowl. There you go. 20 to 17 with Justin Timberlake doing the halftime. It's going to be a good be afternoon. It's going to be All amazing. Right. Hey, I've asked Nick to come up. Obviously, when you see Nick, look at him. Look at him, Michael. He played a little football. <laughs> What's up, baby? What's Nick, actually. You good, baby? Look at these two. All right. Hold on. Now you guys see what I had to go up against. Yeah. Well, actually, Nick played for Virginia Tech, so y'all got a lot in common. Absolutely. He's one of our shepherds, loves the Lord, yep. works with a lot of our teams. How can we... How can we be praying for you? And then we're going to get Nick to pray for you. Um, Everybody's just staring at Nick right now. These are, by the way, I, I just want to go on record. These are real. These are real. This, yeah. There's no creatine. This is real right here. This is real. Yes. I don't even work out. That's what's weird about it. I don't even work out. And I, How can, we, how can we pray for you, Mike? Uh, true, true specimen. Um, I, I would just say, in all seriousness, uh, you know, if you guys want to pray for me, um, I have a, a ton of things that I'm responsible for in, in 2018, from family uh, to football camps um, to being a sports analyst again in, in, in September. And, I always pray that God give me the words to speak before I go out and, uh, and I do a show on Sundays. Um, I always ask God to give me uh, the words to speak to kids and uh, the personality to go out and have fun with them and, and continue to be a role model. And, you know, in my household, you know, I always want to be the best dad that I can be. And now I'm working on being the best husband that I can be. And we'll always continue to work on that because my wife is the most important thing to me in my life. And I feel like I can't live without her. Um, so my actions have to reflect that at all times, uh, moving forward in the future and, and uh, until my last day. So you can just pray that uh, the whole V7 family, because now y'all are all V7 family, yeah. um, is covered under the name of Jesus. Amen. So in all seriousness, Nick has been with us about a year now as one of our shepherds and uh, just honestly loves the Lord, such a humble brother, and uh, always available for prayer and ministry. Man, will you just pray a blessing, him as a father, a as a husband, as, as a servant of the Lord. Let's put our hands towards our brother, and uh, let's just pray for him right now. Father God, we, we thank you, God, for our brother, God, Michael. God, I just thank you, God. Um, for redemption, God, I thank you, God, that you call all of us, God, by your son. And um, he is a fruit of that, God, of redemption, Lord. God, I ask, God, right now that you give him spiritual wisdom, God, in every endeavor of his life, God, in every avenue of his life, Holy Spirit, right now, God, give him spiritual wisdom, God. I ask that you pour it down, God, on his heart and his mind, God, for him to walk um, in a season, God, of wisdom, God, and, and let him be a light to people. Um, that every single person that he encounters, God, I thank you, God, that he can boldly stand uh, as a man of God and as a father and a husband, God. I thank you, God, that you have ordained and put him uh, in this position right now, God, for all men to, to look at and see, God, what a man of God looks like when he calls on the name of the Lord uh, for redemption, God. I thank you and I praise you that he be the father, God, uh, that he's always dreamed of and more, that he be the husband that he's always dreamed of and more, God. I thank you, God, for his, his little girls, God. May they grow up, God, and, and be uh, beautiful queens in the kingdom, God, doing your work and your will. I thank you and I praise you, God, for his life and his living testimony. We speak, God, just love and nothing but blessings and spiritual wisdom over his life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we thank our brother, Michael Vick? Great job, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Love you, man. You're awesome. Hey, God bless you guys. You're dismissed.